Hello everyone, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, good evening, eventually good morning, depending on the place you are attending the uh, webinar uh, in which we will uh, deal or treat what is new in neurourology. My name is Francisco Cruz, I live in Porto, uh, in Portugal. And uh, together with me, we'll have three other speakers. Charles Constantinidis from Athens, from Greece. Giulio Del Popolo from Firenze, Italy. And Celia Duarte Cruz, also from Porto. The URO webinar is organized by the European School of Urology Online in collaboration with the section, the European section of functional and female urology. And this webinar is accredited with one European CME credit. But for that, you have to complete the questionnaires after attending the URO webinar. All of us. Uh, send uh, uh, two questions each and you have to answer them. Celia uh, Duarte Cruz has no uh, disclosures to present, but uh, me, Charles and Julio have uh, 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 conflicts of interest that are presented in this uh, slide. This is the schedule for, the, for this afternoon. So after this short introduction, I will talk about uh, the pharmacological care of patients with neurogenic detrusor uh, overactivity, antimuscarinics or beta-3 or both, or even other drugs. Then uh, Charles Constantinidis will talk about buclinal toxin, Julie Del Popo about the sacral neural modulation and posterior tibial nerve stimulation in neurogenic patients. And uh, finally, uh, Celia Duarte Cruz, who is a scientist, she is not a medical doctor, is a scientist uh, and is doing work, uh, research work with stem cells in the bench. And she will talk about what is new in this area and we, what we might expect in the future. And finally, I hope we might have time for questions and answers. So, I will start now uh, my uh, short presentation. And uh, uh, why I think uh, it is important to talk about uh, uh, neurourology, because the number of cases uh, uh, um, is increasing. This is an example uh, about uh, spinal cord injury and the number of car accidents, motorbike accidents, uh, radical sports accidents is increasing the number of patients with severe spinal cord lesions. And if uh, a few years ago, most of these patients will die quite, quite soon after the, uh, after the lesion, now, as you can see in, this, in the bottom of the slide, Patients, for example, at the age of 20 uh, who are uh, paraplegic, they might live 45 years. That is an average uh, lifespan. And even patients dependent on ventilators might live 25 years, uh, which means that these patients require a good uh, uh, care uh, 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 and uh, essentially a, a good care about their lower urinary tract uh, because if the bladder is not working well, well, uh, the upper urinary tract might be at risk in many conditions. Other example is uh, 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 multiple sclerosis. And uh, as you can see on the right side, uh, uh, this graphic, uh, the, the, the number of cases, the prevalence of multiple sclerosis in northern countries is very high. Also in Italy, now treatments are prolonging the lifespan of patients uh, 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 with multiple sclerosis, preventing the progression of the disease. But we want also to improve the quality of life of these patients which might have along the time of the disease 
uh, 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 problems related with the lower inner tract uh, they might have incontinence. <coughs> Just uh, to remember for those that are less used to uh, these uh, problems, um, uh, we have essentially three types of lesions and they are related with two areas in the central uh, nervous system. One in the pons is the uh, pontine micronation center and the other is the uh, sacral spinal cord segments S2 to S4. The lesions that are above the pontine micronation center, suprapontine lesions uh, that are represented by the A, a letter, they, these patients have predominant storage LUTs. Uh, if we do uh, a neurodynamic test, they will have neurogenic detrusor overactivity, but the coordination between the bladder and the sphincter is maintained, is normal, and so they can empty the bladder and the post void residual will, will remain normal. In contrast, the lesions between the pontine micturition center and the sacral spinal cord, they are the most dangerous ones. And why? Because uh, uh, the connection between the two centers might be lost or strongly impaired. And so the coordination between the uh, bladder and the external sphincter might be lost. And so these patients might have the trusor sphincter dyssynergia in addition to neurogenic detrusor overactivity, high pressures in the bladder, and they have the upper urinary tract at risk. In addition, they cannot empty the bladder completely, and so they have high post void residuals. Uh, and they have symptoms, essentially storage and voiding bloods. And uh, finally, the lesions that are at the level of the sacral spinal cord, S2, S4, or below, infrasacral lesions. Here, the, uh, the symptoms are predominant voiding symptoms, unless these patients have overflow incontinence due to high post void residuals. Uh, in urodynamic, these patients have hypercontractility or a contractility, and so these patients usually have a very high post void residual. Well, so uh, <clears throat> the treatment of neurogenic detrusor overactivity is a critical aspect in the care of a patient with bladder neurogenic dysfunction. And uh, antimuscarinics are uh, still largely used. We don't have one that is better than the other. All of them have a high grade of recommendation, uh, but they have to be used in high doses, higher than those that are recommended for OEB. And of course, high doses will uh, uh, cause more adverse events, dry mouth, constipation, and so the long term adherence of neurogenic patients to chronic anticholinergic medication is usually low. When we start doing uh, the phase three trials with botulinotoxin, uh, we were enrolling patients that were not happy with anticholinergics. And most uh, of them, or at least 50% of them, had in fact stopped anticholinergic medication. And so they had uh, the, uh, uh, the neurogenic detrusor overactivity uh, and the high pressures inside the bladder completely untreated. So they had the upper urinary tract at risk. Now we have another problem uh, with anticholinergic drugs, uh, uh, which is the cognitive deterioration that might be caused by the chronic use of anticholinergics. The risk of dementia is increased uh, by about 50% uh, if the uh, individuals are exposed to anticholinergic drugs, particularly in high doses. And so uh, we have to seriously discuss this point with our patients, with our neurogenic patients, uh, 
uh, because uh, these patients, uh, in addition to their problems, they might have a blood-brain barrier that is less competent than the uh, patients with OAB. There are very few studies comparing antimuscarinic drugs with botulinum toxin because usually botulinum toxin is offered to patients who do not respond or not, are not happy with the antimuscarinic drugs. But this study in spinal cord injured patients carried out in Brazil shows clearly that Butylinol toxin is much superior to oxybutynin in high doses in order to improve incontinence, in order to improve uh, bladder capacity, and also to decrease uh, the, uh, the pressure uh, inside the bladder. The, the, the true the pressure, you can see that uh, with the high doses of oxybutynin, the average was 58, so clearly above the 40 centimeters of water, that is the cutoff for, for risk, while with botulinum toxin was below that cutoff. Uh, well, what about beta-3? About beta-3, uh, what I show or tell you is that we have very few studies. Uh, the drugs are relatively new and they have been explored essentially in OEB, so we don't have yet large uh, uh, phase three trials. We will need those trials in the future because the pilot studies indicate that at least in some groups of, of, some groups of patients, beta-3 agonists like Mirabegron might work very well. So, in this study, you have in the bottom the baseline characteristics of the patients that were then divided into two groups, one treated with beta-3 and the other treated with anticholinergics. And you can see that these patients were, were, had multiple sclerosis, were all continent, but the number of urgency episodes per day, the number of voids per day, and the voided volume were exactly similar, whether these patients were treated with the anticholinergic or with the beta-3 agonist, with Mirabegron. And certainly with Mirabegron, they had less adverse events. Another example of the use of Mirabegron, uh, uh, 50 milligrams, is a combination with desmopressin. And by the way, desmopressin is approved for the treatment of frequency and nocturia in patients with multiple sclerosis. So again, this is a cohort of patients with multiple sclerosis, in this case with incontinence. And you can see that urgency episodes incontinence episodes and the number of pets per day were substantially decreased with a combination of Mirabegron with desmopressin. Of course, we must remember that if we use desmopressin in patients with multiple sclerosis, we have to check on regular uh, intervals and uh, the first time at three days after the starting with uh, desmopressin, the uh, levels of uh, uh, sodium in the serum because of the risks of hyponatremia. This study, again with beta-3 from Belgium, from Leuven, you can see that Patients with multiple sclerosis, Parkinson, or dementia, they are uh, apparently they accept long-term treatment with uh, with Mirabegron. It was not effective in all patients, of course, but when it was effective, long-term treatment was possible. And uh, particularly if you see the line, the purple line that indicates spinal cord spinal cord diseases you can see that these patients were apparently very happy uh, with the long-term treatment with Mirabegron. So the take-home messages uh, uh, about the pharmacological treatment uh, are uh, these five that are in this slide. Neurological diseases are common and available care 
um, offers long life expectancies. And so we have to remember that we need to take care of these patients during many, many years. The second point is that anticholinergic drugs are commonly used uh, and are, of course, effective uh, to treat neurogenic detrusor overactivity if used in high doses. And of course, this has consequences in terms of adverse events. Uh, and uh, long-term adherence to anticholinergics is unfortunately very low. Beta-3 agonists in pilot studies have promising results, uh, so large phase 3 trials are necessary, and just to remember that desmopressin is approved for the treatment of uh, low urinary tract symptoms in patients with multiple sclerosis. So the next uh, speakers uh, will address other forms of treatment. And uh, uh, Cheryl Ambus Constantinidis will talk about botulinotoxin, and we have now two types of botulinotoxins that received approval for being used uh, in patients with uh, uh, neurogenic bladder dysfunctions. Then Julio Del Popo will talk about the sacral neuromodulation and posterior tibial nerve stimulation, eventually a little bit about brain dust stimulation. And finally, the other point that we want also to address here is the research on stem cells. So, Charles Lampus, uh, hand over to you and thank you for your attention. Okay, good afternoon or good evening also from me. All right, all right. My, now my, my subject uh, has to do with the botulinum toxin and especially if there is something uh, new in the field. Okay, so this is, this is the background of the botulinum toxin. We know uh, that uh, botulinum toxin is a, uh, causes a long lasting but reversible chemical denervation that lasts for about nine months. Uh, we use botulinum toxins for more than two decades, and uh, the last uh, at least 10 years is a, a on label a use, especially for neurogenic patients. So we have a lot of experience, especially regarding the ONA botulinum toxin. The toxin injections are mapped over the detrusor in a dose that depends on the preparations that we use. And we know that uh, it is an established knowledge that at least onabotulinum toxin uh, is effective in patients with neurological uh, disorders such as multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury. We have a lot of data about Parkinson's disease, and this is uh, after the knowledge is after multiple randomized control trials and meta analysis. And the new, uh, the new in the field is the use of abobotulinum toxin. Actually, abobotulinum toxin had, uh, uh, had tested in neurogenic patients a lot of years ago. All these trials uh, stopped, but recently uh, the abobotulinum toxin received a positive opinion in Europe for the management of urinary incontinence in adults with neurogenic detrusor overactivity due to spinal cord injury, traumatic or non-traumatic, or multiple sclerosis, who are regularly performing clinical and catheterizations. And uh, actually, almost all over Europe, this is an official improvement. These are the publications that uh, uh, the publications of the randomized control trials that the abobotulinum toxin gain uh, its approval. So these are uh, two phase three randomized double blind studies. Actually, they had uh, recruited patients from all over the world with spinal cord injury and multiple sclerosis. And uh, take in your mind that all these patients are incontinent due to neurogenic detrusor overactivity, and all these patients already were uh, under uh, were performing clinical terminal catheterization for the management of their bladder. The uh, these studies had three arms. Uh, they are testing uh, abobotulinum toxin, six hundred units, eight hundred units, or placebo. 
this is the flow chart of uh, of all these uh, of both studies and uh, you see that uh, the the three arms are equally uh, divided between placebo 600 and uh, 800 units and it's also important to see that the, in, in that trials it is also a good balance not only between the three groups but also among the spinal cord injury and uh, multiple sclerosis patients so so the three groups had uh, equal uh, number of patients almost equal patients uh, of both uh, the conditions that uh, they were uh, tested the primary endpoint was the mean change from baseline in number of neurogenic detrusion incontinence episodes per week and they are measured at uh, week six at six week the secondary endpoints were the uh, patients the totally continent the proportion of patients that were totally continent and of course they had the uh, parameters regarding the quality of life and urodynamic parameters and uh, the time uh, that they need uh, to repeat the treatment safety was also assessed and statistical analysis were conducted for pool populations by etiology in uh, the three arms of the studies and we see that uh, regarding the primary point and the incontinence episodes reduction, we see that uh, after the sixth week, there is a um, statistically significant reduction of the incontinence episodes related to placebo, but there was not difference between the two doses of the abobotulinum toxin. Similar, there was in a similar way, there was an increase of the bladder capacity at the sixth week. Uh, and the inclusion was statistically significant related to placebo, but not between the two doses of the toxin uh, themselves. Regarding the quality of life, it was measured by the ICOL questionnaire, and uh, we have a, an increasing in quality of life in uh, both doses uh, of the toxin. And uh, at the same time, there was no difference between the two doses but the difference was between each dose and the placebo so summarizing the data of abobotulinum toxin uh, 485 patients were randomized there was a significant reduction in the mean neurogenic detrusor incontinence episodes per week with uh, both uh, doses of the abobotulinum toxin and there was a significant improvement in quality of life, but also there was improvement in urodynamic parameters. The median time to retreatment was longer in patients with multiple sclerosis than those with spinal cord injury. And actually, this is a, a data that uh, we have uh, already seen also not only in abobotulinum toxin, but in all abobotulinum toxin as well. The safety data were similar between the two etiologies. Urinary tract infections was the most frequent adverse event, but there was similar number reporting across treatment groups. And actually, we have one of the first studies that they tried to compare the two toxins. The, the both are botulinum toxin type A, the onabotulinum toxin, and the uh, abobotulinum toxin. But uh, you, we can understand that this is an, a review and. It, the comparison is indirect, so they take the data of the randomized control trials that they have already published. And uh, if we see this uh, study uh, in the results, I have underlined that there were no statistical significant differences between the both uh, the two types, uh, the two different botulinum toxins in the coincoordinate episodes and uh, the adverse events and the UTIs. At 12 and 24 weeks, the difference in reduction of incontinence episodes per week was considered clinically relevant when comparing the higher dose of abobotulinum toxin with onabotulinum toxin. Uh, we need, uh, of course, we need a lot of trials uh, or to, for having head-to-head -head comparisons, but we can 
uh, as a first impression, we can say that both toxins are at least equal uh, managing uh, this kind of patients. So coming back to our already established knowledge that it is um, that regards both uh, types of the toxin, the botulinum toxin type A, we know that the repeated injections seems to be uh, possible without loss of efficacy, even after initial low response rates, uh, based because we have a lot of years of follow up, so uh, we already know that. We can switch between different toxic variations, and by switching, we may improve the responsiveness, especially when one toxin is not uh, work anymore, we can switch uh, to the other one, and we have already have uh, some data for that. Urodynamic studies might be necessary after treatment in patients with uh, maximum detrusion pressure more than 40 centimeters in order to monitor the effect of the injections on bladder pressure. Uh, this is very important because these are high-risk patients for deterioration of the upper urinary tract. Or we, we need to be sure that our treatment is effective. Additionally, we have uh, we know that uh, the application of the toxin is beneficial even in patients with low morbidity after failure of uh, augmentation of bladder augmentation, and uh, another use of the toxin may be the use in patients with an indwelling catheter and concomitant bladder pain or catheter uh, or leakage uh, through uh, or by uh, the catheter. Terminal catheterization may become uh, ne necessary, and this is especially in MS patients, as they do not offer performed terminal catheterization prior to intravascular botulinum toxin injection. So that's why the ABO botulinum toxin they had already tested in patients that they are already in a, in a program of terminal catheterization because. Uh, the usage of intermittent catheterization, the, UT, the need of catheterization in patients that they do not uh, in that program may be considered as an adverse event. Uh, and we have some studies that we know that maybe in MS patients we need a lower dose of the toxin, at least when we speak about onabotulinum toxin, uh, in order to be sure that they would not uh, need uh, catheterizations after the application. The most frequent side effect is UTI, retention, and hematuria. Of course, there are some rare complications that they include generalized muscle weakness and autonomic dysreflexia. But these complications uh, are rare. Um, it is important to, to have uh, in our mind autonomic dysreflexia especially in the time that they, during the procedure uh, of uh, the injections through the cystoscopy procedure. Okay, and uh, regarding botulinum toxin, the future, uh, we know that they, there is a current research focuses on different delivery uh, approaches to injections such as liposome and encapsulated botulinum toxin in order to decrease the side effects. So summarizing using our guidelines, botulinum toxin A has been proven effective in patients with neurological disorders due to multiple sclerosis or spinal cord injury in multiple randomized control trials and meta-analysis. And that's why it is strongly recommended to use botulinum toxin in order to reduce minogenic detrusion of overactivity in these patients, if, of course, if adenosine therapy is ineffective. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. So I stop share and I give uh, the floor to our coordinator, Francisco. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Cheryl Lampus. Thank you very much for your clear presentation. And now, uh, now I. We'll invite Giulio Del Popolo. Uh, you are not in Firenze, you are somewhere else in Italy, I think. But uh, for us, it doesn't matter, he's from Firenze. 
to talk about uh, uh, sacral neural modulation and uh, about the tibial uh, pseudo tibial nerve stimulation in patients with neurogenic bladder dysfunction. This is something new because it was uh, used in OEB uh, and uh, now uh, it is possible to be used in neurogenic patients. So please, Julia. Many thanks, Brian Cisco, and I think this is a very very interesting field because I think it's uh, what we like more in a neurology uh, field is uh, to enter in the neurological control, box control over the human body. If you look at uh, the milestone uh, in the treatment of a neurology patient, uh, was a great introduction in the 70s, the intermittent catheterization, then anti-muscarinics, and then uh, in the same decade, uh, also Afrabogler. But it was at that time that we see the best result using uh, electrostimulation with the intravesical uh, electrostimulation just to recover uh, uh, a good uh, bladder voiding or to treat uh, overactive bladder. And uh, one of the first uh, uh, treatment in neurological patient was by Brindley in the 1976, but uh, he had uh, no result after the first implant. And after he developed the system with Tanago Smith in the 80s, uh, and uh, this technique uh, provides uh, a rhizotomy, a posterior rhizotomy, and also an implant of uh, anterior sagra roots. And in 10 years, uh, they had a lot of patients, uh, more than 100 all over the world, with a good result. But now, no anymore, because rhizotomy is not accepted by our uh, patient. But Tanago, in 1981, uh, published with Smith the first paper of the first implant of sagral neuromodulation in a, a spinal cord patient. So uh, a neurologic patient was the first implanted with the sagral neuromodulation, but was one of the last to have approval for sagral neuromodulation. And also about PTNS and TTNS, you could see uh, the first paper uh, were about uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, both uh, using the percutaneous uh, technique, but also using also the transcutaneous techniques. Uh, the difference is that the first one, you have just a cycle of 12, treatment for about one month. In the second case, you can do a daily stimulation at home. And so you can have also different uh, efficacy. But if you look at the history, first we had the CA mark for sagral neuromodulation in Europe and then the FDA in 1997 for OAB and after for urinary urination and then uh, for uh, uh, for uh, vagal incontinence. And uh, if you look uh, in, uh, in the history, but we treated a lot of off-label uh, patients like uh, uh, constipation and also pelvic pain, but also neurogenic bladder. But now, at least if you look at ICI guideline, what we found here are both are PTNS, TTNS, and also sagra neuromodulation are recommended as a minimal invasive surgical treatment. And as well, if you look at the algorithm for fecal incontinence, we found again as a, a good option after a conservative treatment fail as a neuromodulation. But if we go back, one uh, great revolution was uh, uh, leave the open uh, technique and uh, doing uh, the percutaneous technique that was introduced by Spinelli. And this uh, allow also to treat more neurological patients, but the limit was that this system was not MRI compatible. If we look uh, uh, about uh, some published paper, 
here you found uh, uh, this uh, paper that uh, report about uh, uh, more than 60 patients uh, and uh, about uh, 37 were implanted, uh, all with NDO. And uh, at uh, a follow-up of four years, uh, they refer to maintain uh, their result with improvement of continents. And uh, they found that a better rate of test response was uh, patients that have peripheral neuropathy. Uh, similar uh, was uh, our study, but not about uh, overactive uh, neurogenic overactive bladder, but about uh, urinary retention uh, in incomplete spinal cord patient. And uh, what we found was to have a good response about in one third of our patient. And uh, a good uh, uh, sign that uh, uh, this kind of treatment can work was if they refer to recovery, the first sensation of bladder feeling. And uh, one of the really interesting for us, uh, but really these uh, results are uh, for a little bit incredible because uh, uh, Carl Dietrich Sievert implanted 10 patients just during the spinal shock. So when there are no reflex and deliver of the lesion. And the result was that they had, uh, they have no urinary incontinence. So they have a good continence and also have a good bowel function. And also they report uh, that they can achieve the erection. And uh, this is uh, really incredible. But unfortunately, this was uh, just uh, uh, a paper uh, in 2009. And uh, at the moment, uh, there was uh, no news uh, anymore. But this is uh, the dream, maybe to implant patients just when uh, they have uh, uh, at the start of the uh, neurological disease. And uh, another the effect because we have to keep in mind that when you do sagra neuromodulation, you can interfere with all pelvic floor uh, uh, function. So we can interfere uh, with uh, uh, bowel function, with, uh, uh, with the bladder function, but as well with the sexual function. So what we found in our patient that were implanted for the bladder dysfunction was uh, that uh, they refer to have uh, uh, also some improvement about the sexual discussion, about the sexual function, both in male and in female. And uh, uh, these uh, results uh, about the bowel improvement uh, in patients that were implanted uh, for a bowel problem, uh, pushed all uh, colon protology also to use uh, neuromodulation in uh, spinal cord. And here they report a very good uh, uh, result for bowel incontinence. And as you can see, most of them are but people with a spinal cord injury because usually it's not easy to use the same system and then you have a few patients with multiple sclerosis implanted for the limit of MRI. So this uh, review now is a little bit old, about 10 years ago, but what uh, the group of uh, uh, Thomas Kaiser report was that is a good efficacy, no adverse event, but uh, uh, the study are so with this, so small cohort that they have no evidence level at the moment. So there is no level of evidence enough for this kind of patient, for neurology patient. And if we go about PTNS, in the long term, we have a good result, but in this case, we found more and a more uh, multiple sclerosis patient. And uh, in this paper, Kabai report that they achieved a good result for NOAB at 12 uh, week, but they maintain this good result on frequency, nocturia, urgency, and also incontinence, also uh, at two, 12 months follow-up. 
This study is uh, um, uh, more realistic for uh, multiple sclerosis because they report a good result in long term. But the problem sometimes is that you can't give a judge about the figures in the long term because there is the progressive neurologic course of multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis that can impact on the result. And what about TTNS? TTNS is easier to, to do also because you can teach your patient and they can do it at home. And in this case, what uh, in this report, they uh, found that uh, in patients that cannot tolerate anticholinage drug, daily TTNS reduce OAB symptom and improve quality of life uh, in a multiple sclerosis patient. This is a nice study because uh, this is a, a just a, TTNS versus uh, control sham. And uh, what they found was that uh, uh, in the sham group, they had a worsening uh, uh, the synergia, the Schuster Spinkler synergia. Instead of uh, in the TTNS group, uh, the uh, function was not so worse like uh, in the uh, sham group. So this means that TTNS. Uh, can improve the uh, blood fraction in neurological patient uh, if we use it uh, in the acute stage. And uh, in this uh, paper, it's very interesting because you know, and Francisco underlined how important is uh, urodynamic evaluation uh, in the neurologic patient. And uh, here, uh, we have similar results using bilateral TTNS or anticholinergic, but we have a real, uh, not same result, but uh, bad result in patient, poor result in patient using a sham. So this means that TTNS is really efficacy. And what about, is more efficacy TTNS or PTNS? In this study, they reported that both have the same efficacy, PTNS and TTNS. So also if this was a mixed population, but uh, mainly uh, not neurogenic. So there are few neurogenic patients, but it's a good data to think about. And this is a nice study because uh, like, uh, Sievert with the Sagra neuromodulation here is a study just in acute phase again, but for rats. And uh, as the previous study that I show in the spinal cord uh, uh, patient, here they demonstrate how uh, tibial nerve stimulation can improve lower urinary tract function. So this is interesting that you use uh, this stimulation during the spinal shock, and when the reflex activity come back, you have a better function than people that don't do this kind of treatment. But again, this review, what show? Show that the TNS is effective and safe for treating patients with unloaded, but you need more reliable data uh, to uh, have a, a better evidence uh, of efficacy. So for this, uh, there is a new study, is a multi-centric study, and we just started this study with a lot of control, a lot of urodynamic, a shun group. Uh, for this, we think that maybe in the future you can have some more evidence about the efficacy of TTNS in and looted. So, Percutaneous is no better than transcutaneous, but they are similar. TNS can prevent the onset of neurogenic lutet, as demonstrated from some paper. So is TTNS an alternative option to sagra neuromodulation? Uh, this study about Bowel uh, with the sagra neuromodulation TTNS reported that uh, uh, Sagra neuromodulation uh, is uh, uh, improved functional outcome and quality of life uh, much better than PTNS. 
Uh, and this could be also because PTNS is just a stimulation for a period instead of uh, sagra neuromodulation is a daily stimulation so can maintain better the result. So what new? New is that also for PTNS there are a new kind of uh, stimulator, some with a uh, timing and some implanted. But unluckily, this kind of lead at the moment are also no MRI, and this is, could be a limit. So at the moment, we are waiting for the result with the implanted PTNS. And uh, about the sagra neuromodulation, uh, at the moment, new is that you have a new uh, instrumentation that are MRR compatible. So this means that in the future, you can have more and more neurogenic patient implanted. You have not only interstim, but also the axonics, and also the opportunity to have, instead of a, a, a normal battery, a rechargeable battery. But on my mind, I prefer also the normal battery because to recharge every week, your stimulator is not uh, the ideal in my in my uh, my thought. And uh, maybe now there are a lot of center in the world that are looking for new way of stimulation. For example, this is uh, our study that is going on in the pig, just using an intraneural electrode that go inside the pudendal, just to have an impact in on afferent and efferent way. So maybe in the next step of a human uh, test, we can say something different uh, uh, because in the last 20 years, we have the similar system uh, that uh, was developed by Tanago. So in conclusion, uh, I just report what are conclusion by the AUA guideline uh, panel on neurology. Uh, this is the same for tibial nerve stimulation and for uh, uh, PTNS. They uh, demonstrate the efficacy, but uh, at the moment, uh, they need some more study to have uh, a good uh, evidence. But the common sense say that the PTNS at the moment is a non-invasive treatment, so it should be the first option uh, you have to discuss with your patient. But SNM seems to be more effective than uh, PTNS in the long time. And, uh, also, you have a stable, at the moment, uh, stimulation a long time. So this is what you have to use uh, using your experience and also uh, the patient desire. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Giulio. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. And uh, of course, for those that are attending, remember that <clears throat> MRI compatibility is extremely important if you want to use uh, these devices in your neurogenic patients. And now I would like to uh, ask uh, Celia Duarte Cruz to give her presentation. So please, Celia. So hello to everyone. I don't know where you are in the world, but uh, I leave here my email. So if if you if you have any questions, feel free to send me to drop me a line, and I can also share the papers that I read with you. So it is obvious that the management of of lower urinary tract dysfunction after spinal cord injury uh, is an active area of research, and one of the most exciting areas is actually the one focusing on regenerative medicine. Now, if you go through the papers and the books, there are many um, definitions of what is regenerative medicine. Um, lots of people refer to cell-based uh, approaches, engineering materials, and this is possibly the most broad, um, the, the broader definition of regenerative medicine. There is a lot of inputs and a lot of need 
to develop these new curative and reparative strategies. So of course, regenerative medicine actually relies a lot on, on stem cells. And we, we all have many, many stem cells. They are located in all of our organs. These cells have an enormous potential to maintain themselves so they can replicate and reside in our organs. And then when they are needed, they can differentiate into many cell types and they can repair the tissues. Now, in terms of, of clinical and animal experimentation, these cells, when you implant them in a host, and can actually induce an immune response. So your best, your, your best option is actually use your own cells. Sometimes, however, that is not possible. And then you resort to you to resort to other types of cells. Of course, cells from other species or the same species from other own, uh, other donors will require some handling in the lab to allow for a proper implantation. Now, stem cells they are not they are not created alike. So the most plastic, the most um, the, the the cells that can divide the most are the ones that are obtained for embryos, like the zygote or cells that are obtained from blastocysts. These cells are able to fully differentiate in different types of cells. They can replicate with an enormous velocity, and that's actually a drawback because when you insert them into a donor, they actually can go so quickly that they will form tumors. Also, we cannot forget that there are immense uh, ethical issues regarding the use of embryonic stem cells. Hence, the majority of studies, I'm sorry, are actually using adult stem cells. So these adult stem cells, they aren't uh, able to replicate as quickly and as intensely as embryonic stem cells, but still they are really good candidates for cell therapy. Now, in the context of spinal cord injury, when you're thinking about like a trauma, when you lose neurons, the most interesting cells that come to our mind are actually neural stem cells. And neural stem cells are able to renew the tissue. They reside within our central nervous system. They can differentiate into neuronal progenitors and glial progenitors. And then these progenitors will respectively originate both neurons and astrocytes. Whereas these cells, we know that they reside, for example, in the hippocampus or in the central canal. Today, we know that we can generate neural stem cells via the red reprogramming of, for example, fibroblasts. And in the context of spinal cord injury, these cells have been tested in several rodent uh, studies. And I know this is a busy table. I'm not expecting you to read it uh, from one point to the other. So I've just summarized here the main, uh, the main messages. So the, the, these neural stem cells have been tested in different types of spinal cord injury in rodents. So the most common model was the contusion. Uh, we have cells that, so we have administration, for example, of neuroprogenital cells, but se these cells have also been used in combination with glial restricted progenitors. This, in some cases, these cells have also been combined, for example, with trophic factors. And in many cases, they have been injected at the lesion site. So delivery was restricted to the place where the tissue was damaged. And when you follow your animals and you do the urodynamic evaluation, there, there is actually an improvement of several urodynamic parameters, including bladder capacity, postvoidal residue. If you look at the bladder weight and sometimes histology, there is also improvement of bladder function. What is interesting is that once you inject or you apply your neural progenitors, the progenitor cells, you aren't really able to, to know if these cells are going to differentiate, for example, into inhibitory neurons or glutamatergic neurons. Plus, because they are really indifferentiated and really mobile, once you inject them in the site, they will actually spread and colonize the tissue. And once they do that, you can't really know if they are able to integrate where they were placed, if they are going to die. And to clarify that, that issue, a recent study actually used a very elegant uh, study, an elegant approach. So in this case, 
um, the, the researchers use embryonic stem cells. These cells were treated in laboratory and they were differentiated into GABAergic neurons. These GABAergic neurons were injected some centimeters away from the injury site and these animals were allowed to live for a couple of months. And during these months, they were tested, for example, for pain, for neuropathic pain uh, behavior. And their bladder function was also assessed by using the voiding spot assay. And what the researchers were able to see was that these animals actually had less pain. They also had a pattern of voiding spots that was, most, that was more similar to naive animals, also the size of the bladder. And also the histology of the bladder was more close to, uh, to naive animals. What was interesting is that they were able to see that these cells didn't die. These cells were actually incorporated in the neural circuitry within the spinal cord. And these, this integration was actually beneficial for the animal. Now, if you remember, I just said a little bit um, that these cells are resident within the central nervous system, or you can obtain, obtain them by reprogramming other cells. And this can be challenging. So it's not easy to obtain neural stem cells. And for that reason, there, there are many other studies that have been using mesenchymal stem cells. Now, this is, this is a very heterogeneous, heterogeneous uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this is a very varied uh, cell population. They are spindle-like cells. They can differentiate into various cell types and you can manipulate them into that. And they can be isolated from different, um, different organs and different tissues. And then the number of places where you can collect these cells is actually increasing by, by the year. Now, the most well-characterized mesenchymal stem cells are obtained from bone marrow, which, were, which is the place where they were identified in the first place, from the adipose tissue, and also from the umbilical cord. Now, these cells have been used, have been studied in many other uh, contexts beyond spinal cord injury. So, and so it's easy, to, it's, so researchers uh, can identify them in a, in, a, in a more easier manner because now we know exactly which surface markers they do or do not express. Now, in terms of experimental uh, studies with rodents, mesenchymal stem cells have also been tested in what concerns the bladder function. And in this case, the, the results are a bit more numerous, but also more varied. Uh, so we have studies that use compression or transection. The injection has been done to the lesion site, to the bladder wall, to the tail vein. Different types of mesenchymal stem cells have been tested, whether they are obtained from the umbilical cord or from the bone marrow. And they have been shown that, again, to the, the, their administration actually improves not only urodynamic parameters, but also they were able to reduce the bladder remodeling that we see that occurs in these animal models. Mesenchymal stem cells have actually been tested in pilot human studies. Now, in this case, the, the cells that have been tested has actually, have actually uh, are obtained in the, in the majority of cases from the bone marrow. We, I, I wasn't able to find any studies using neural stem cells. And contrary to rodent studies, the majority, the, uh, most studies actually delivered the cells at different distance at, 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 uh, dip, sorry, at different di distances from the lesion site. The amount of cells that was injected into each patient was also very different between studies, and the timing of, of injection was also very different. An important uh, consideration that we need to, to take is actually that the patients were also very different between themselves. So you have patients with cervical lesions, you have patients that were Asia A or Asia D, you have patients that had spinal cord injury for six months or almost 15 years. So of course the results are very, diff very different between studies. So there are studies that, sh that show that there is improvement of root function, but there are also studies that show that that improvement is not so, so evident. Importantly, because it hasn't been described in, in rodent studies, there were adverse events that were recorded, for example, fever, headache, and even some some pain. Now, 
at this point, despite this less exciting uh, scenario with human studies, I think it's it's there is robust uh, evidence showing that stem cells actually contribute to improve bladder function after spinal cord injury. And why do they work? How does it happen? Well, starting with these neural progenitor cells, these cells actually are able to produce a sort of cellular bridges that allow the, the neurons that survive the trauma to overcome the glial scar. And they are able to regenerate circuits, as you see here. Some of these cells will actually differentiate into oligodendrocytes. So there is remyelination of the neuronal tracts, improving neuronal communication. An important aspect of these stem cells is that they are also able to, to control the immune response, the inflammatory response that you have at the spinal cord after trauma. And how does it happen? Well, stem cells are able to produce a collection of anti-inflammatory molecules on, of modulatory peptides and neurotrophins. And uh, this collection of, of, of molecules is released into the medium via these small exosomes. And these exosomes will release these proteins that will have a suppression effect on both the immune response and apoptosis that we see happening after spinal trauma. And also there is enhancement of reparative uh, phenomena like the formation of new blood vessels, regrowth of axons, repair of the blood, sp blood spinal cord barrier, and even neurogenesis. Now, this is exciting. This is uh, enticing. There's, there's, these are positive results, but of course, there's, al there's always room for improvement. And one of the things that we need to, to look is whether we can choose better cells. So the majority of studies have been done using bone marrow cells and neural stem cells, and these are not always easily accessible. So in that context, there is a lot of, of investigators now turning to the use of adipose stem cells because they are easy to collect. They can be collected with less bothersome procedures, and they are easily manipulated in the, labor, in, in the lab. An important aspect that we also need to consider is that the studies so far have been collecting these cells and injecting them as a solution. So the cells are, are fluctuating in, in the medium. And when you inject them, they actually will diffuse throughout the, the, the tissue. So in order to restrict your cells and in order to contain the effect of your cells to the place where you want them to be, technology has been developed to produce these cellular sheets like here we're with, with, uh, with adipose stem cells. And in this study, these sheets have been transplanted, transplanted into animals that had a little, bit, a little bit of spinal cord removed. And as you can see here on the right, this is the histology, uh, an horizontal section of the spinal cord. In animals that received these cellular sheets, there is protection of the non-injured tissue and some repair of the injury site. In the bladder, in blue, you have collagen, you have the signs of fibrosis. And again, this type of approach to the spinal cord was able to prevent the degradation of the bladder wall histology. Another area that also needs to be considered is that is whether we can potentiate these cells. So these cells are actually grown in, in, in the lab and are injected as they are. So can we modify them, for example, with CRISPR-Cas9 and enhance their, their release of trophic factors? Can we in, enhance the release of their immuno, immunomodulatory um, effects? Perhaps we can. Another important aspect is, can we combine the cells with specific carriers, again, to make them more potent, to make them more, more efficient? For example, combining them with hydrogels. Another issue that I didn't have time to bring today is actually the secretome. So there's also evidence, for example, in recovery of motor function, that we don't really need the cells to improve the motor function of, of spinal cord injured rats. It's actually the secretome, that collection of molecules that is good for the animals. The problem is that to administer secretome to, to bigger animals like rats or rabbits or dogs and even more, even bigger humans, you need to increase the volumes of secretome product production. You need to standardize the way you produce this secretome, and you need to obtain a good enough quality for human use. 
Another point that for me it is critical, and it's it was easy to see both in clinical and experimental trials, and that is that protocols need to be standardized. So we need to, in rodents, use the same type of, of injury, the same type of application, in order to really compare, to really really compare results and really move forward. So overall, I think that there is reason to, to, to accept that stem cells and stem cell technology is able to improve bladder function, both in terms of urodynamic assessment and remodeling at the bladder wall. There are a lot of experimental results that are really exciting with neural stem cells, but mesenchymal stem cells really need to be further investigated. Pilot human trials have been done using bone marrow stem cells, but likely they, these pilot trials will expand into adipose stem cells. I'd like to conclude just by saying thank you to, for your attention and leave you with a picture of my hometown, Porto. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. Uh, eventually, now we might use two or three minutes uh, just to answer uh, uh, two or three questions. We don't have time for more. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> eventually, I will start uh, by one question that was put to, to uh, by Dr. Samarinas about uh, botulinum toxin. And so that is for you, Cheryl Lampus. When do you change from uh, the uh, antimuscarinic drugs to botulinum toxin? Do you wait three months, six months, or there are some cases you almost start immediately with with toxin? Uh, in my daily practice and uh, talking about real life of uh, these neurogenic patients, uh, after the at the beginning maybe we double up the dose of uh, the antimuscarinic. Or maybe we combine one antimuscarinic drug with a beta-3 agonist. Or sometimes we can use a double dose of antimuscarinic and a beta-3 agonist. And if we see that in that condition, the patient either cannot, uh, cannot be tolerant, has a lot of adverse events, or still... Uh, it, it is incontinent or still we have some aerodynamic data that uh, they say that he is still on danger uh, this is uh, I will uh, go to botulinum toxin but sometimes we go earlier if we see that uh, after one anticholinergic uh, the patient has a lot of adverse event we will go uh, directly to botulinum toxin and usually there are a lot of patients that they uh, they are in a very high dose of antimuscarinics. We administrate botulinum toxin. They decrease antimuscarinics uh, step by step. And after some months, they start one pill, maybe a second pill. And at the end, we repeat the toxin again. Mm -hmm. uh, I have another question and now for Julio. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kontaksakis is asking about the parameters you use for uh, PTNS. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I already answered, but uh, we have a uh, uh, standardized parameter for idiopathic patient, uh, and usually is uh, 20 Hz for frequency and uh, uh, 200 millisecond uh, for duration. But in neurogenic patient is very variable and uh, sometimes you use also 80 uh, hertz of frequency. So we need uh, higher frequency in uh, neurogenic patient. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, have, uh, I saw also another question, Francisco. Yeah, yeah from Marshall, <laughs> my friend, Albeck, and uh, it's very detailed because uh, he speaks about, uh, if you want to make a question, uh, or... I no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, what, you can, what you can do in a patient that had uh, a high residual urine, myogenic damage in the bladder due to uh, prostate obstruction, if 
after uh, uh, 2RP, we can think to use a sagra neuromodulation. This is a good question. It can work, but it depends from the damage of the detrusor muscle. If the detrusor muscle is uh, not completely destroyed, it can work. And anyway, if the patient uh, have a good uh, also uh, bladder expression sometime, uh, uh, called, with the sagrar neuromodulation, they can find a, a better coordination between uh, bladder expression and uh, pelvic floor uh, relaxant uh, during the body phase. So, in my mind, uh, a test of neuromodulation in this kind of patient that don't solve high residual after 2 RP can be done. Well, uh, we have uh, to finish, but before that, I, well, I can imagine, Celia, that uh, uh, stem cells uh, and clinical trials with stem cells are still far away. Uh, eventually, pilot studies might be tried, but uh, as you, uh, Julio said, with the, the sacral neural modulation during spinal shock, it is a pilot study, and uh, in the end, uh, it is lost uh, uh, somewhere I I in the literature. <laughs> but uh, uh, for patients with uh, um, spinal, uh, with uh, 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 multiple sclerosis, the no-go weight treatment, uh, do we have some news about it? Uh, I know that a few years ago, they tried to uh to facilitate the growth of the cell uh, of neural cells using antibodies anti no go a well as far as i know the anti no go is, uh, is actually more advanced in, in the spinal cord injury context rather than in the ms so i know that the, if i'm not mistaken the clean the ongoing clinical trials already in phase two um, the problem with MS is actually the, the immune modulation that you need to, to control. So it is difficult to give an antibody when you have this inflammation going on. So that's the compromise with MS, and that's the most challenging. Uh, and just a quick note on the stem cells. I think, yes, uh, you, were, you were mentioning the pilot studies. I think that we are closer than we were, because if you think about it, at least in Portugal, the pressure to, to freeze the umbilical cord from babies means that you have a lot of young adults now that have their own samples fr freezing uh, some stored somewhere, it possibly being used, for example, in treatment of spinal cord injury or in repopulation, for example, of the urethral sphincter. And that we don't know, for example, how long can we store these cells? So are we saving the cells for nothing? Are we saving the cells for someone else? So I think that's an active area of research. So uh, we have to finish. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all the 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 the, the, the attendants. We had a, a large number of attendants with us during all these uh, during the last hour. I want to thank all the the speakers, uh, Celia, Julio, Charles and of course, the technical, the technical support from Crystal and from Claudia. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And uh, uh, for those that have any doubt, please uh, uh, email us and we will try to uh, reply to, to you as soon as possible. Have a wonderful uh, rest of the day, a wonderful afternoon. Uh, and... Uh, Eventually, we will see each other in another webinar about neurourology. Thank you very much for uh, your collaboration.